Hello, my name is Lolita White and I work for the Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysis, also called DMEPA, within CEDAR for the FDA. Today, our learning objectives are or will be to describe the Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysis role in pre-marketing and post-marketing activities to prevent and address medication errors. We'll also assess current strategies aim to increase the safe use of drug products by minimizing use error that are related to design, names, labeling, or packaging of drug products. We will evaluate examples of regulatory action taken to address recent medication errors and also discover how you can help identify, prevent, and mitigate medication errors. So now let's have a brief introduction to DMEPA. Here is a description of the organizational structure for the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR. The Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology is a super office within CEDAR that is further divided into two smaller offices, the Office of Pharmacovigilance and Epidemiology and the Office of Medication Error Prevention and Risk Management, or OMEPRA. The Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysis resides within OMEPRAM. So who looks at medication errors? DMEPA was created back in 1999, so we recently celebrated our 20 year anniversary. Within DMEPA, we have about 60 safety evaluators who are pharmacists, nurses, social scientists, and engineers, each assigned to a specific therapeutic area. So in our division, we have a dedicated safety evaluator assigned for each area. For example, there is one safety evaluator who is assigned to the division of psychiatry products. That safety evaluator covers all aspects of the product development from pre-market to post-market. In cases where of post-marketing issues, we also have a rapid response team, which you will hear about a little later from one of my colleagues. What is DMEPA's mission? Our mission is to increase the safe use of drug products by minimizing use error that is related to the naming, labeling, packaging, or design of drug products. To achieve this mission, DMEPA is involved in all of the following. We conduct safety assessments of proprietary names for drug name confusion that may lead to wrong drug errors. We also serve as signatory for these proprietary name reviews. For example, should a sponsor desire a proprietary name, they'll propose that name to us for review. In turn, we will ensure that the safety aspect of the proposed proprietary name has been reduced to reduce the risk of medication error resulting from name confusion. We also assess the promotional implications to ensure that the proposed proprietary name is in compliance with other requirements for labeling and promotion. We review labels, labeling, packaging, and product design for risk of medication error. We also review we human factor human studies factor to, optimize to optimize product design product and minimize the risk of use error. error. We review post-marketing error case reports to identify safety signals and take action if needed. And lastly, we participate in the development of guidance for industry and FDA staff work groups and advisory committee meetings. So what is a medication error? A medication error, a medication error is any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional, patient, or consumer. So in this figure, we can see where adverse drug medication error may result in non-preventable harm and where a medication error result in no harm, but where the two intersect is where there is preventable harm. And that is where our focus in DMEPA lies. Now, 
Now, when we think of safety and what leads to error, the average person would like to focus not on why the error occurred, but try to place blame on the person who happened to make the error. If we punish them, we solve the problem, right? Wrong. The problem is seldom the fault of an individual. It is the fault of the system. Change the people without changing the system, and the problem will continue. In Zemepa, we look for ways to proactively change the user experience or, if possible, change the device so that use errors are least likely to occur. This process relies largely on revising user interface based on best practices, but also relies on human factors process to evaluate the need for additional mitigation. Now let's take a look at some safety considerations for product design, considering human factors. When we talk about human factors and medication error, human factors is at the core of medication error prevention. If we understand how humans interact with the system, we can better prevent medication errors and optimize appropriate medication use. This slide shows that there's a risk level continuum. The red line represents the original design and whether the product originally carries high risk or low risk. If human factors is applied to optimize the product design, the risk is decreased. There are two types of approaches to mitigations, mitigating risk of medication error. Reactive, where the design issues with drug products are identified and not remedied until post-marketing. In these cases, the issues are only resolved after a medication error has reached and potentially harmed the patient. Or there's proactive, where design issues are identified early on and addressed prior to marketing to prevent medication errors from occurring. Now let's briefly walk through the regulatory history for devices and explain where FDA's regulatory authority to require human factor studies stem. We start with the device regulation 21 CFR 820.30 to demonstrate safe use. There's also a drug regulation which comes from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, specifically the Kefauver Harris Amendment to the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which is a requirement to show that a drug is effective. Now, if we put the device regulation together with the drug regulation, we can further say that human factor studies may be needed to demonstrate minimization or elimination of use-related hazards and medication error. Keywords are may be needed. So we don't always ask for human factor studies. For example, Human factor studies may not be needed for pre-filled syringe used by healthcare providers in a healthcare setting because in that case, the risk is mitigated based on the user group and the use environment. This slide shows the drug development process and where human factors and DMEPA involvement fit in. DMEPA involvement usually begins when the IND is filed, but can be as early as the pre-IND phase. Human factors work, including the product design, preliminary analysis, formative work, and validation testing begins during the pre-IND phase and can continue through phase four. Updates to the use-related risk analysis are made continuously throughout the drug development process as risk is continually assessed and reassessed. Next, let's talk about the process of how DMEPA engages other divisions within the agency to perform human factors evaluations. Now, NMEPA is the lead division for review of human factors submissions for drugs, biologics, and combination products within CEDAR. However, we may issue an inter-center consult to the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH, their human factors team, 
when input is needed for certain device heavy products, for example, an external infusion pump or software driven medication dispenser. The MEPA may also consult the patient labeling team for review of the IFU to ensure the language is patient friendly and clearly presented for instructions that are specific to lay users. Let's say a particular combination product's IFU contains specific instructions for a patient and caregiver to administer the product at home. This is an instance where we'd work with patient labeling team to get their input on how to best provide clear instruction for the lay person. What is a combination product? A combination product is made up of more than one constituent part that is regulated by more than one center given complexity of the product. A combination product can combine drugs, devices, or biologics, can be physically combined, for example, a drug in an auto injector, or chemically combined. It may be co packaged in a kit, for example, a drug vial co packaged with a prefilled syringe, or can be separate cross label products. For example, the drug label indicates to use the drug with a specific device, something like a nebulized drug to be used within a 510K clear nebulizer machine. These are some examples of combination products. Pre-filled syringes, pen injectors or auto injectors, inhalation products, transdermal delivery systems or patches, drug infusion devices, and kits. When speaking of product design, the use-related risk analysis should be seen as the basis for product design and is also informative to determine if a study is needed to ensure safe use. It is a crucial step in identifying use-related hazards. When evaluating risk, the sponsor should consider who will use the product, how they will use it, where they will use it, also, considering these user characteristics or surrounding use scenarios will help inform a safe design. Evaluation of all critical tasks and the use risk is crucial to identify use-related hazards and any consequence which may result in failure to complete these tasks successfully. The use-related risk analysis is a way to detail out all of these consequences as well as propose mitigations to the user interface to decrease user risk. Proactive risk assessments. Now, in the product development process, we recommend the sponsor use a proactive risk assessment when formulating a product design. Things like understanding how users interact with the product user interface, identify specific tasks or use scenarios that can cause harm, correct identified risks. To reiterate, these all should be done and considered early to ensure safety of the product design. Early stage considerations are key to ensure appropriate users and use environments are considered. The earlier the sponsor interacts with us, the agency, the earlier we can help them employ processes to ensure decreased risk of medication error, which may be attributed to user interface or device design. It is important to consider all of the users and use environments to allow for a comprehensive identification of risk. Now, what is considered a user interface? A user interface is not just a device, and all the things you see here should be considered user interface that includes any labeling that comes with it, any special packaging provided with the product, and any delivery device constituent part, all of these things are considered user interface. The goal is to ensure that the product user interface is optimized. The most effective strategies to improve the design of the product user interface include improvements to anything that the user touches or reads to use the product, evaluation of why error occurred by make by making design changes to ensure these do not cause errors, identify mitigation so that these errors cannot occur again. Consider known use risk and lessons learned from similar products. 
So based on the results of the proactive risk assessment and use-related risk analysis, the sponsor may determine that they need to perform a simulated use test, which is a systematic collection of data from representative participants in realistic situations. So if the, the use-related risk analysis has identified risks in the use of the proposed product, which may result in patient harm, that the sponsor is unable to mitigate with known or already implemented best practices, then in this case, the sponsor will need to provide results from a simulated use testing. The human factors process is considered an interlocking process where information can be linked to help determine human factors validation needs. What we expect the sponsor to do is use performance data from the study and subjective feedback from participants to examine use error. We also expect that they will evaluate the, risk, the root cause analysis of how the error may have occurred. Then determine what, if any, of the user interface needs to be further optimized. Lastly, determine if the mitigations that are implemented will need to be further validated. So if we've done all the assessments of risk, why do we still need a simulated use testing? We need this testing to help us as an agency determine whether the intended users can safely and correctly perform critical tasks under the expected use conditions without error or harm. The simulated use testing seeks to assess data representative of actual users performing critical tasks. We expect that as part of the study, the device user interface represents the to-be-marketed version. And then, results from the study can be used to update the use-related risk analysis and determine the acceptability of the data collected or if any additional mitigations are needed. So after the study has been completed, the key answers the Human Factors Validation Study Report needs to provide are does the user interface support safe and effective use? Are there any device design mitigations we should make based off of the results of the study? The study report will provide an analysis of the use errors in both subjective and objective format to allow us, the agency, to evaluate how these use errors may impact the user or the patient. If the study results show that there are substantial modifications needed for either the device or the user interface, it may prompt an additional study to validate those revisions. As part of the mitigation strategy, the sponsor is tasked with to ensure there is an acceptable residual risk. And what is the true residual risk? A residual risk is beyond practicable means of risk reduction through elimination, mitigation, or control. Based on the sponsor's determination of residual risk, they may be able to justify that no additional human factors data is required. After the sponsor justifies their study results and concludes the product is safe and effective, We'll we will provide our own result or review of the results of their data to determine if we align. Now let's take a look at some safety considerations for labels and labels. We just talked about user interface and how we use human factor studies to determine if any mitigations are needed to improve safe use. So now let's talk about some of the effective strategies we use in DMEPA. These strategies are largely focused on evaluating the product prior to marketing, but it continues on into phase four or application submission phase. We continue to evaluate user interface to identify any error prone features and consider any post-marketing lessons learned in order to minimize the risk of medication error or patient harm. When we talk about what aspect of the user interface could pose risk for medication error, what most people think of first are lookalike labels and labeling. Here in this picture, you can see that there are some similarities in these product labels and carton labeling. While we don't want to infringe upon the company's First Amendment rights to brand their products in the way they see fit, 
There are some aspects of the labels and labeling that we know from post-marketing perspective we can improve upon. This is a picture of the principal display panel or PDP. Our efforts to standardize the PDP results in a decreased risk of product selection medication error. For example, the PDP should have proprietary name, established name, strength, route of administration for non-oral products, and warnings, cautionary statements. Since these are considered the most important pieces of information on the product label, we want to ensure this information is very prominent on the label to maximize readability. We also recommend that manufacturers use at least 12 point font when the label size permits to improve readability. We ask manufacturers choose text and background colors to afford adequate legibility of text and avoid color combinations that do not afford maximum contrast. Although there are lots of important pieces of product information, the placement of that information all within the PDP may lead to decreased readability. So we should be careful with what type of information is included on a PDP and also that the information presented is adequately and prominently placed. Things like text surrounded by adequate white space, clarity of important information presented without distraction of images or logos, which may decrease readability. For any information that is not as important for product identification or selection, we recommend that information is presented on the side or back panel or in the prescriber information labeling. As I mentioned before, the route of administration must be present on the PDP for non-oral products per federal regulation. We also like to ensure that the route of administration is not abbreviated as certain abbreviations or acronyms and symbols are dangerous. Additionally, we recommend using positive statements for the route of administration. In the example here, you'll see the route of administration states for intravenous use only and fatal if given by other routes. The reason why we recommend affirmative statements is because we have post-marketing reports where users have overlooked the word not. Depending on how the container vial is positioned or something may cover the word not as well. We also like to ensure that labels and labeling do not contain uh, certain abbreviations that may be misinterpreted or acronyms or symbols, symbols which could be different, dangerous. For example, the non-standardized or unfamiliar abbreviations, symbols, and dose designations may lead to mistakes. ISMP has a list of abbreviations that are misunderstood or misinterpreted, and we typically use that list in our review of product labels and labeling. In this example, the patch strength is 100 micrograms. However, the unit of measure is presented with the letters mu and g, and in one particular case report was mistaken as milligrams. Thus, we recommend using MCG for micrograms to avoid this confusion and dosing error. With regard to the product strength on the container label, we like to ensure that the unit of measure is consistent across the product label, prescribing information, or any other labeling such as cartons, container, IFU. Picture here are some issues in this example. With the vial, the strength states 10 milligrams. However, should you look at the prescribing information for this product, the dosing for a perioperative hypotension is 50 to 250 micrograms as IV bolus. This would require the healthcare provider to do some calculations to ensure that they draw up the correct dose. In a periop setting, you may not have that time and while rushing could result in a calculation error. We also like to ensure that the strength is presented in metric units such as milliliter, milligram, microgram. On this bottle, the strength is expressed as 16.2 milligrams. However, in parentheses, it states one fourth grain. 
which can be confusing or interpreted as gram. In the case of a product that has multiple strengths, we recommend the use of techniques to ensure prominence and differentiation within the product line. Things like boxing or coloring, shading, using different font types. All these help decrease the risk that a product selection medication error may occur, which could potentially lead to an underdose or overdose. Here are some more examples. Oftentimes, there are warnings that are important enough that they need to be placed prominently on the principal display panel of the label. The presentation of this information is important because warnings should be clear for the lay user and also concise due to lack of space on the label. What we have learned from post-marketing cases is that affirmative statements are better understood. For that reason, should a sponsor suggest a warning be included, we do not recommend the use of a do not. We recommend affirmative statements to better communicate what should be done instead. So instead of saying do not administer subcutaneously, we recommend for intravenous use only. Or in a case where a product is only given at one frequency but the dose varies, it may not ensure safe use to add that frequency to the principal display panel. For example, in this case where the strength is 1 mg per tablet, but the dose is 6 mg per dose. This may lead to confusion and medication error if you include the frequency of once daily on the principal display panel. In cases where storage information is important to the efficacy of the drug product, or in cases where a special packaging is needed, we make sure that the information is prominent so that there is a decreased risk of patient harm based on improper storage conditions. For example, in, these, in this case of refrigeration, dispensing the original container, and things that will impact the efficacy of the product, these, product statement, these warning statements are prominently placed on the principal display panel or bolded in box to increase prominence. Barcodes are used to help in product identification. However, presentation of the barcode should be in such a way that is readable by scanners. Thus, we aim to ensure that there is enough white space to allow the scanners to read the barcode. Also, we like to ensure that it's not placed where it can be truncated or damaged, such as on a perforation, as in these examples. Here's an example of one easy mitigation used to relocate the barcode so that it will not wrap around the tube and instead the barcode is placed on only one side of the tube which is easily scanned. Now, let's talk about the responsibilities of, of you all in the medication error prevention process. Now, what is our responsibility for the FDA? As a regulatory agency, the FDA can help to minimize the potential for medication errors through our pre-marketing, proprietary name reviews, product design, and labeling analysis. We must also swiftly take corrective action once problems are identified in the post-marketing arena. We also need to be involved in risk communication and management of risk association with error-prone products. And finally, conduct research to advance the scientific knowledge surrounding medication error. As far as the pharmaceutical industry, we expect measures, measures to provide clear and concise labeling are explored and interaction with the agency as early as possible to help with that directive. We also expect, should any use error or medication error occur, that action is swiftly taken to rectify any concern. There's also a role for the healthcare provider to offer assistance by reviewing the product labeling prior to prescribing, communicating clearly to the patient and caregivers what the expectations of use are for their product, and should they become aware of any side effects or errors, we expect the healthcare provider will report those to the FDA MedWatch program. There is also a patient responsibility. 
Patients can help by being more involved in their care, asking questions about the risk of their treatment, asking for counseling on their new medication if it is not readily given. In addition, patients too can report medication errors to the FDA MedWatch. In summary, in TMEPA, our goal is to identify and address vulnerability to use error or medication error as early as possible so that we may be proactive in preventing patient harm. The early assessment of products, devices, and user interfaces is an important aspect for us to reach that goal. In addition, the collaboration of patients, healthcare providers, and the FDA can help to address these concerns in a timely manner. I included this as a reference, but this concludes my presentation portion. Um, you can watch, uh, you can look at these or check these websites out on a later date if you need more information. Now we have some questions about the presentation. The first question is, the Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysis role is A, work in pre-marketing activities to prevent and address medication error. B, work in post-marketing activities to prevent and address medication error. C, DMEPA is the lead division for review of human factors, submissions, or D, all of the above. And the answer would be all of the above. Question two. One example of a regulatory action taken to address recent medication error, A, requiring all container labels to be the exact same uniform color, B, requiring the pharmacist to use an app to read all look-alike, sound-alike drug names aloud prior to dispensing, C, we do not address medication errors at the FDA, or D, Requiring the principal display panel to only include limited important product information to eliminate clutter and increase readability. And the answer would be D. The last question is, how can you help identify, prevent, and mitigate medication error? A. Healthcare providers should report all medication errors to MedWatch. B. Patients can inquire and know the risk of their treatment. C. Healthcare providers should involve patients in their own care, or D, all of the above. And the answer is D, all of the above. Thank you, Lolita, for that wonderful presentation. We have a few questions, and I'll encourage all of our participants to type your questions into the pod in the lower right so we can ask our prevent presenter um, and get some great insight. So our first question is for Lolita. When assessing use risk, how do you determine if a step is critical? Aren't all steps critical to use the product correctly? Hi, uh, this is Lolita. Thanks for that question. That is a, a good question, actually. Um, what we like to say, we get that question quite often, but what we like to say is it is really up to the sponsor to determine the criticality of that task. And what we like them to do is um, perform their use-related risk analysis, which is what I spoke about in my presentation. 
And the youth-related risk analysis will help the sponsor determine what is critical in the use of their product. And how we define critical task is any step which, uh, if, if it's performed incorrectly or not performed at all, would or could result in patient harm to either the patient or the user. Um, so when the sponsor is performing their youth-related risk analysis, they have the opportunity at that time to determine which of those steps in the use of the product will impact the user critically. Um, so not all steps are critical. Um, these tasks that they find to be critical, if they meet this criteria, this definition, once the youth-related risk analysis has found these steps to be critical, then they're able to um, determine if any feasible mitigation that are known with similar products exist on the market or if it's something that they cannot or, or have not found a mitigation for, then they may need to say, this is critical in the use of my product. It may lead to patient harm. There's no mitigation, so we need to study this as part of a, a human factor simulated use study. So it's, it's, a, it's really um, a couple of steps you need to take to determine what's critical. It's not all steps that are critical in the use of your product. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, do you, the person wants to know, do you have a list for products which need human factor studies? For combination products used by medical staff, are, is it safe to assume no human factor studies are needed for those products? Thank you. Um, so we do not have a list of products that need human factor studies. There's not, there's not really a way to have one list. The, the determination for the need of human factor studies is based on, um, again, what I just spoke about, the risk, the use risk of the product. Um, let's see. Even if there is a medical professional where this is only going to be limited to in the use of this product, we, a lot of times we like to believe that the professionalism or the scope of practice for this medical staff will negate the need for a study and uh, we'll just assume no study is needed. However, we like to have um, an assurance that all use risks have been evaluated and have been considered. So again, this is where the use-related risk analysis comes into play. And if there are any similar products that are marketed already, then they can perform also, in addition to a risk analysis, a comparative analysis where there's a comparison of the proposed product and the already marketed product to identify any differences um, that would cause concern for um, use risk. After they can, after they completed these assessments and the sponsor is able to determine that their particular product does not have any new or unique risk. Um, that is something that's outside of the scope of the normal use for this particular identified user group. Then they can determine um, that either yes or no, a study is needed. So we don't we don't have a list of products, and it's just because each each product is unique. Um, maybe if it may be unique to different users or unique to product characteristics. So we want to make sure that a comprehensive assessment has been done for this particular product, regardless of the user's user group. So yeah, that's why we don't have one list. Um, we always want to make sure all of the risks have been comprehensively evaluated. Great, thank you so much. All right, our next question is again about examples. Um, when could you provide examples where an oral drug may need an instruction for use or human factor testing? Okay, so oral drugs are, um, there could be a time when you need an ISU for oral drugs and human factor testing. And again, I have to give the answer of it depends. Um, one example that I can think of for an oral product that may need an IFU, it could be something that is packaged in some type of special packaging, um, something like maybe a blister package where you take 
a oral tablet on certain days or, or maybe quite a couple of times a day, um, depending on your condition and what you're being treated for. In that particular case, um, we would consider this to be a complex labeling instructions or complex dosing instructions. So we would encourage um, an ISU in this particular case. Uh, if it's something that uh, it would say um, uh, a stop or start on a certain day, like I'm thinking of a medraw dose pack, those something of that caliber would probably need an ISU. However, uh, the second part of the question is, would we require human factor testing? So again, I'm going to go back to the risk analysis for this answer. If there is a risk analysis that is performed as part of the, the, the product development um, uh, process, and we have already noted, we've already, we already know that there is a already marketed product that is very similar to this proposed product, we will ask that or we would ask that the sponsor provide a comparative analysis of their proposed product to the already marketed product for and identify any differences or, or similarities with between the two. Now if within the sponsor's analysis they find that there are no differences, um, then they can provide a justification to us along with their risk analysis and the comparative analysis to say our proposed product is the same as the already marketed product. We have not identified any new or unique use risk with our proposed product. Thus, we are submitting our use of later risk analysis, our comparative analysis, and a justification for no human factor study needed. So um, I'm going to have to say that after we receive it, it will be a review issue to see if we're able to determine if we can align with that um, justification. And what we'll do is we'll review what has been presented to us and we'll be able to provide a written feedback to determine um, if we can conclude that, yes, you have correctly addressed all the risk and use of your product. We agree that there's no differences or no unique uh, risks with your product. And in that case, we could agree that no study is needed. But again, it's going to be a it depends type of answer. Thank you so much. That's a great. Um, our next question has to do, if you can discuss a little bit about adverse event reporting and medication errors related to human factors. You know, how does that, how do, how do they report them? And if you can just discuss how those inter, intersect. So we have um, something called MedWatch that we use in uh, FDA to receive all types of um, medication errors and sometimes um, they may be confused with adverse event errors, but it is all within the MedWatch um, reporting system. So once the sponsor or the patient or um, whomever would have uh, reported a medication error to MedWatch, then we would, um, that is received within the FDA and then triaged to go to the correct um, division within the FDA. Um, if it is medication error related, then it will come to us in DMEPA and we will um, determine what, if anything, needs to be done to uh, address the medication error. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So our next question, I think this is going to be our last question. Does the agency want to see data from label readability studies? And if so, how should those studies be done? So a label readability study, I believe um, we're referring to label comprehension studies in this case is, is our terminology. What we normally do is once the sponsor interacts with us um, within the IND stage or, or pre before they submit their marketing application, we will be able to know if the proposed product that they, um, they want to submit for agency review is something that um, will require some complexity in their instructions or complex labeling. 
Um, what we normally do is prior to any marketing application being submitted, we interact with the sponsor and we'll let them know in advance that this particular uh, labeling that you propose may have some issues with um, comprehension or readability in such a way that we believe uh, a label comprehension study is needed. In that particular case, particular case, we treat it the same as a simulated youth human factor validation study where we ask that um, you go over the use, the comprehensive steps in the use of your product in a youth-related risk analysis again and determine which of those steps are critical. And of those, uh, we ask that you provide a, a, a question where the reader is able to, um, to go over this label and determine um, if they're able to interpret the labeling as intended. So um, again, as, as early as possible, we like to have interaction with the sponsors. And because of that, we're able to um, inform the sponsor on what, if anything, by way of studies are needed. So this will be an example of um, once presented to us, we would be able to determine the readability or the comprehension of the labeling to determine if any study is needed. So, thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lolita, for that wonderful presentation and for taking time to answer all of the questions, so many of them that were submitted. Um, we appreciate it. And next, we're going to move on to our next presentation and hope everyone stays tuned. <laughs>